a physical counterpart that's seen some wear and tear over the centuries. That means it's in ruins. But in the etheric octave, the Temple of Truth is fully functioning, trimmed in gold, in a style and on a scale similar to the Parthenon in Athens. The contrast between the ruined version of this temple on the physical level and the complete version on the etheric level represents a good way of illustrating the contrast between the vibratory rate of mind and matter that assures immortality in heaven and that which is vulnerable to mortality, war, earthquake and decay on our level. As etheric travelers, we're interested in exploring the higher frequencies of life on our earth. We know a fair bit about our physical world, but we're mostly unaware of the higher levels. So we take the go-for-it attitude of an explorer and say, we know heaven is somewhere we can't see beyond our horizon yet, and we have the faith that this higher world exists. The right vehicle to explore it is internal, our etheric body. But to make these voyages to the realm of immortality, we do have to leave behind the things that define mortality. Things like our everyday speech, where we alternate between idolatry and criticism, flattery and sarcasm. The inharmonious vibration in that kind of everyday speech keeps us as mortal as an aging physical body. But the etheric part of us can at least visit the higher world where there is no aging. The master we're about to visit in the Temple of Truth on Crete has compassion for how we're weighed down by our mortal indulgences. But he won't put up with us bringing any of that baggage with us, even on an introductory visit. Let me tell you why. The master's name in his final life was Hilarion, born in Palestine around 290 AD. He became a lifelong devotee of Jesus and was famous as a remarkable healer pursued around Palestine, Sicily, and Cyprus by crowds who pleaded to be healed. Hilarion knew it was God doing the healing through him, even if the crowds didn't. He was an amazing man, a kind of holy man known as an anchorite. An anchorite is the opposite of a hermit. Even though Hilarion might have wanted to be a hermit, the magnetism of the Holy Spirit was so strong in him that he attracted people whether he liked it or not. Everywhere he went, he was the anchor of a spiritual community, even if he and his followers lived in caves or simple huts. El Moria had a similar lifetime as an anchorite, in his life as Saint Sergius, where he anchored a healing community in a Russian forest. Hilarion was an anchor for the Holy Spirit of healing in the deserts around the Mediterranean. That was his final lifetime on our physical level, completed about 372 A.D. And like Jesus, Hilarion balanced his karma, fulfilled his divine plan, ascended, and became a teacher in heaven of visiting mortals like us. Hilarion was and is a saint, but the real drama you should know about this master is in his backstory. Who was he in previous lives before he was the healing anchorite Hilarion? Remember Lady Liberty, Serapis Bay, Lanto, and Paul the Venetian, and other masters who have visited and will visit, who served in physical temples on Atlantis, and were warned of the impending collapse of that civilization and the land itself? In a much earlier life, the soul of Hilarion was one of the trusted few who were directed by God through the Holy Spirit to take the divine flames on public display in the Atlantean temples, to safety in Egypt, France, Greece, Eastern Europe, the Andes, and the Himalayas. Why were these flames divine, and why were they so important to civilization? The soul of Hilarion was a high priest in the Temple of Truth on Atlantis over 12,000 years ago. He was one of Sanat Kamara's 144,000 volunteers. And when the warning came about the Atlantean cataclysm, he was well qualified to carry the eternal flame of truth to Greece. The location chosen for the safekeeping of this celestial flame presence later became known as Delphi, a prehistoric shrine and town in a mountain valley in central Greece. Over thousands of years of divine sponsorship, this shrine allowed a long
long line of trained priestesses to faithfully uphold the office of the Oracle of Delphi. The Oracle was an ongoing dispensation of qualified access to heaven for the true, if cryptic, answer to difficult personal and civilization building questions for the ancient Mediterranean people. For a while, Athens and other Greek city-states were the protectors of the sanctity of the Oracle of Delphi. Hilarion hasn't revealed how many physical lifetimes he spent in service around the shrine, though it's likely he was involved in keeping it and the nearby town viable. But after Greece's victories in the Persian Wars, around 480 BC, a series of holy wars broke out over the control of Delphi. And eventually, the lineage of the oracle was infiltrated by fallen ones, and the true answers became mixed with error. The oracle and the shrine fell into disrepute, and the town was ruined by raiders and abandoned for centuries. Throughout the post-Atlantean millennia, Hilarion also had a long association with Jesus as his teacher. The relationship remained close over many lifetimes, and there were contemporaries during Jesus' Galilean embodiment, though they never met physically. The snag in that life was that unlike most of Jesus' apostles and disciples who were poor tradesmen, the soul of Hilarion was born into a wealthy rabbinical family in Roman Palestine. His name in that life was Saul of Tarsus. He took his upper class intellectual upbringing and training as a leading Pharisee to an extreme. His pride and zeal in defending long established Mosaic law became a direct confrontation with the progressive revelation and higher offering of God's grace and forgiveness, which was the message and mission of his teacher, Jesus. In other words, Saul refused to read Jesus' memo that if you forgive others, God will forgive you. So the harshness of the old dispensation of Mosaic law, an eye for an eye, seen in the Old Testament, was and is transcended by mutual grace. The Son of God mediates between God, who sees only perfection, and man, who's still subject to imperfection. Despite many lifetimes of loyalty to Jesus, Saul was as forgetful as us in the physical world and just as vulnerable to making serious mistakes in judgment. His mental body had no recollection of those lives close to Jesus, and as an intellectual, he didn't listen to his intuition. To him, there was no grace, only the law. You remember the stoning of St. Stephen and other Christians? Saul was there. The negative karma caught up with Saul on a trip to Damascus where the teacher, Jesus, in his etheric body, returned part of Saul's karma, mercifully, as temporary blindness. The change in Saul was so drastic that his intense pride, zeal, and intellectual superiority was dissolved and repolarized to a deep humility. He finally realized what he'd done to innocent people. Those who had recognized the new dispensation of grace and forgiveness to buy time when he had completely missed it. Jesus reclaimed him and renamed him Paul. And so he dedicated the rest of that life to paying off some aspects of the energy tied up in his errors of judgment. There, but for the grace of God, go we. You can read about Paul the Apostle's sincere efforts to redeem his mistakes in the New Testament. His letters or epistles illustrate the dispensation of grace, allowing the sincere time and opportunity to repay debts to life, whereas Mosaic law demanded swift karmic return. Grace transcends the law, the Ten Commandments, but doesn't replace it. Forgiveness buys time and opportunity to repay the debt, every jot and tittle, even if it takes another lifetime. And so Hilarion needed another lifetime to heal the mortal damage and pain he'd caused to so many in his rule as Saul of Tarsus. He was reborn in Palestine about 300 years later. With Jesus' direct sponsorship through the Holy Spirit, Hilarion was trained in his etheric body in the Arabian retreat where we have visited, though he preferred the life of a hermit. Hilarion became an anchorite, a magnet of Jesus' light wherever he traveled, and he completed his mission to the public as a healer of thousands. 
This is the brief backstory of the wise, humble, and very determined master we're about to visit. As we call for our blue escort angels to take us soon to the etheric realm over Crete, allow me to mention one aspect of the unexpected that we might encounter. Jesus taught Hilarion that the divine meaning of concepts such as truth are often best presented as mysteries. Jesus was a master of brevity in presenting mysteries in the form of parables. Hilarion, given his polarized experience as soul, knows that we have latent soul faculties that can quickly comprehend divine truth in symbols or story, while our mental body might only look for the dictionary definition. Our mind's job is to organize day-to-day -day mental comprehension. Our soul, though, is hidden from the day-to-day -day as intuition, gradually maturing in the ability to pick up the cosmic awareness of God, thinking like God, instantly knowing universal truth without a dictionary. Here are our beautiful angels arriving now. Hold on tight to your angel's arm and we're up and out of our sleeping bodies and on our way at the speed of thought undistracted by dreams of the day past and each of us eager to explore our upper world. The glint of sunlight on the glassy blue of the etheric sea we know in our world as the Mediterranean tells us that we're at high altitude on our way to Crete. There are so many islands in the heavenly version of the Mediterranean, all of them green and inviting with sandy beaches that we're dependent on our angels for navigation. One of the things to take in and savor in moments like this, gliding over this island in heaven, is the sense of peace and wonder at the richness and harmony of life on the ground below us. There's an anticipation of absolute safety, comfort, beauty, and friendliness everywhere you and your etheric body will go. And now, as we spiral in, we see the columns of a long white and gold temple set in lush grounds on the north side of the island. From above, we notice the main entrance to the temple is comprised of a series of broad, white, marble stairways leading up to golden doors set in behind the outer colonnade. Moments later, we touch down lightly on lawn, some distance from the great stairway. As we thank our angels, a master from the temple, in a white robe with green stripes around the sleeves, greets us and begins walking with us through the gardens. Overhead, the sky is a bright blue. Around us, small birds in the trees and flowering bushes carry on conversations in short melodic cadences. There's a feeling of happiness in the air and a sense of expectation that we're here to find out something new and wonderful. Our escorting master points to the long flights of stairs up to the temple and explains that beneath the broad ascent there are classrooms and council halls that we'll see in a few moments. We lose count of the number of stairs as we climb to the golden entrance doors and go into the high-ceilinged foyer. The color emerald is everywhere, as panels of jewels, as thick carpeting and as tapestries. Then, as promised, we led down several flights of stairs to the luminous halls and the council chambers where the masters meet and pray, and the classrooms where we're told we'll be welcomed on future visits. Some classrooms are full, some have only small groups gathered around a candle-lit fountain. Everything seems so organized, so beautifully set, that we ask if we can sit in on one of the classes now underway. Our escorting master smiles and tells us, all in good time, and that there's something important we need to experience first. We take the stairs on the far side of the temple back up to the foyer level, and the master pauses there to prepare us for what he describes as our approach to the main altar, where the flame of truth has remained alight in the same place for over 12,000 years. Now, we're in a semi-private alcove off the main foyer where it's quiet, very quiet. We're asked to meditate on the quiet, calm our eagerness to learn everything at once, and simply ask in our hearts to be shown what we need to understand next. The quietness and inner focus helps us relax, and after a while, we hear singing, choral music, 
but we can't tell where it's coming from. The master asks us to follow him and now we're in an aisle leading to the main altar at the center of the temple. This is where the choral music is coming from. We stand still and listen. sacred music whenever we can. At the center of the Temple of Truth, there's a single great pillar, 100 foot away. Set into the pillar, a golden brazier holds an intense, fiery, emerald green flame that radiates a presence far beyond the temple itself. Standing in that light is like getting used to the pressure and radiance that will strip anything unlike itself from your oldest memories. And yet the flame in the brazier barely flickers. There's no source of fuel and there's no sound, except the melodic strains of choral music weaving arcs of light intertwined in braids above us. Choral singers are the sisters and brothers of the temple in their white and green robes. They're gathered in concentric squares around the central pillar all focused on the perpetual flame. Time passes differently in heaven and in our third body, which is more objective than our emotions, not as restless as our physical body, and much quicker on the uptake than our mental body. As the passing of time yields to a perpetual now, our awareness is drawn higher by the Holy Spirit, closer to the mind of God, into what we need to understand next. It's different for everyone. One moment we're standing in the light show and the updraft of the choral music, and the next we realize it's quiet again. The brothers and sisters have left the altar, and we're being asked to sit comfortably on the mosaic tiles, on the line of one of the outer concentric squares, in direct view of the timeless emerald flame. Time ceases and the quietness returns. As I said, the experience in heaven, in the presence of a divine flame, is different for everyone. As your traveling companion, I can only explain that my attention on the flame didn't take me back into hidden memories needing to be resolved, but upward in awareness to experience something new. This is what I remember. I saw an image of myself during the workday in our world as a synthesis of four overlapping bodies with the different frequencies, physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual, acting as one. But it occurred to me that the synthesis was incomplete because I could see my etheric body there. I was above myself, observing my four selves as one objectively but kindly. Who was the I observing the worldly me? The answer came in an instant knowing, best summed up as, I am he. The he is the mediator, the universal Christ, able to intercede between the perfection of God and the imperfection in me. There was no mental confusion, just a calm recognition that the core I is and has always been perfect and one with the presence of God, father and mother to all life. I am native to heaven. I am unrealized on earth. I lovingly regard the lower me, fully aware of the imperfections, at peace. I see the synthesis of my four earthly bodies in the physical world as a kind of necessary expedition, a mission that involves gaining balance where there's imbalance. The balancing requires mastery of the rules of time and space, and the expedition has been delayed by adversity. 
I am the authority for my mind, memory, feelings, and physical achievements, and I will overcome the adversity in time. My four lower vehicles are aligning with the plan and the schedule and are gradually coming into balance, like integrating the four sides of a pyramid. From the many, one. At some point I find myself back in my etheric body, enclosed in the rays of the emerald flame, pondering the upward journey I had just experienced as I. Tentatively, I attempt to take stock of the whole of me. The key was the moment of knowing I am He, but it was temporary. The He, I instantly understood, is the universal Christ that Jesus, Gautama, El Moria, and Hilarion became permanently. From the many individualizations, one universal Christ. So what occurred, which was new and wonderful, during this visit to heaven, was a momentary merging with an immortal, limitless I. There's an upper part of me that has the authority of the universal Christ, and by extrapolation, the same would apply to you. I was given a momentary glimpse of unity with God, and a plan and a schedule addressed with authority to the worldly me. The ascended masters are in this state of Christ authority perpetually, when Jesus delivered healing grace through St. Hilarion, the etheric body of Hilarion was raised to this state in the desert every time. No physical, mental, or emotional disease or disorder could exist in the higher vibrating presence native to heaven in Jesus and conveyed willingly through Hilarion. By proximity, the slow-moving vibrations of any diseased state would be overwritten and dissolved in the perfection and presence of the universal Christ. In a flash I thought, what if healing practitioners in our world were already training here with Hilarion, but their workaday selves didn't remember? What if they knew that authority? What if they could combine the best of medical science with the Holy Spirit? We could bypass expensive, controlling artificial intelligence and the anti-competitive pharmaceutical cartel and heal the karmic causes of disease as standard practice. Let the doctors find proximity and invocation in the light. That's what came to me in the temple, not far from the flame. I realize others are speaking in whispers around me and so I remember now to resume my duties as your traveling companion, which include being alert to changes. At that moment we look up to see our tour master in front of us, asking us to rise. And then, without any fanfare, he calmly says, I would like to introduce you to the hierarch of the Temple of Truth, the Ascended Master Hilarion. The Master Hilarion steps forward from the altar, emerald flame in the great pillar behind him, and surveys us for a moment. Whether the concerns in us are huge or small, he seems to draw them all into his two outstretched hands. Then, as if to say, I hear you, he smiles with the warmth of the one who's seen every concern the world can worry about. We're in the presence of a saint right now. Once a mortal person like us, who let God flow through him, because that's all that mattered. He was once a mortal who, through God, healed thousands, thousands of every illness imaginable, and would do the same for us. The Master turns his hands up in the air, all our concerns now in God's care, and then looking at us, begins to speak. I stand before you that you might know that heaven cares, that heaven is concerned, that heaven is determined to make that all-out effort to restore balance to body, mind, and soul, to being and consciousness, to make you whole. Therefore call upon the healing masters and watch how mankind will be restored to the right mind of God, to the right desiring of God, to the right knowing, to the right being, and the crystal clarity of the all-seeing eye of God will be the vision of the victory. When mankind become the fullness of truth, they will demand truth across the planetary body and they will rise up 
and overthrow the liar and the lie, the despots who stand upon that lie. When they are filled with the healing light, there will be no stopping the people of this planet, and they will usher in, by the God flame within, that golden age of freedom. Let the souls of mankind be free. We stand to uphold Saint Germain. This is our offering to him, to you, and to the age to come. In the name of Jesus the Christ, the healer of all time and space, and in the name of the cosmic Christ, I am the humble servant of the flame of truth. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. With these few words he surveys us again, bows to the Christ in us, and leaves with a knowing look that seems to say, I'll see you again soon. We bow to him, and then our tour master guides us out to the main level of the foyer and out into the sunshine. We stand in silence for a few moments between the enormous columns, and then the master comments on the hierarch's short address. There is a hidden level to what you think you heard from the master. It may have sounded as though Hilarion addressed you with a statement of heaven's determination, but you are expected to reply. It is his hope and intent that you remember every word he said and return his determination in the form of a prayer, a series of requests. He's inviting you to a dialogue. He's saying, man proposes, God disposes. So propose, put us to work. This is the meaning of call upon the healing masters. This is the brotherly love and opportunity in God that the masters offer freely. Such a prayer, part of your dialogue with him, might be a fiat like this. In the name of the Christ, make us whole. Restore mankind to the right mind of God, to the right desiring of God, to the right knowing, to the right being. Restore the crystal clarity of the all-seeing eye of God so that we have the vision of victory and understand what it means. Help us to become the fullness of truth and to understand that too. And in knowing and demanding truth, guide us as we rise to take dominion over the liar and the lie, to be as wise as serpents and gentle as doves. Help us to understand that God flame within us that is divine intervention in our world personified. Show us what the golden age of freedom can be as that God flame grows in us. Let the souls of mankind be free. According to the will of God, it is done. The master stretches out his hands and says, God said, command ye me. If these things be your will, and you know they're God's will, they will appear on earth as they already are in heaven. Ask for them with this fire, and you will receive them. He pauses, perhaps to observe our reaction, then looks up and gestures at our blue angels approaching the temple from all directions. At his invitation, we take the long flights of stairs down to the gardens, and the Master assures us that we'll be back at a time of our own choosing. The courses we can take in understanding the nature of something as elusive as truth and healing in our world will be at our own pace. As your traveling companion, I can say before we go with our angels that when you visit heaven, it's okay to be astounded at concepts you don't yet understand and that seem so easy here and so difficult to imagine on the commute in the morning. So as an experimental piece of homework, try conveying by intuition to your commuting self in the morning that you definitely have this gentle power in you to change our world just by asking God once every 24 hours to free mankind. And let's see what your mental body, your conscious awareness, thinks about that. One more interesting point that Hilarion mentioned is Saint Germain. The soul of Saint Germain, like Hilarion, has had a long and close bond with Jesus through the New and Old Testaments all the way back to Venus and earlier. 
we'll be visiting him two tours from now. You can read up on Hilarion and all the masters and retreats we visit in our reference book, The Masters and Their Retreats, which you can browse and buy if you want on AscendedMastersSpiritualRetreats.com. You can also find more on St. Hilarion by searching Wikipedia, but remember, that final lifetime as an anchorite ended around the year 372 AD. The Ascended Master Hilarion is alive and well, and your go-to etheric teacher if you're a doctor, healthcare practitioner, scientist, researcher, or healer, or even if you lean toward agnosticism, atheism, or skepticism. You'll find Hilarion and the Brotherhood of Truth have seen and heard every disillusionment with life, religion, mistreatment by clerical authorities, rulers, tyrants, and others over the centuries, and they respond one-on-one -on -one with love, comfort, truth, and vision for the way back to the mind and heart of God. Every Ascended Master has their own stories, and they themselves are proof that the way back through love is doable. Before we take off, our next tour will be a most comforting and loving visit with a Lady Ascended Master whose name is Nada. You may not have heard of her because as a master who's followed in the footsteps of Jesus, her work on behalf of mankind is still mostly behind the scenes. A sacred labor can be described as ministration and service, or the power to change civilization for the better by pure love, helping other people seemingly perform miracles. And as always, expect a surprise. We're up and on our way, heading home to our sleeping body. Lots to contemplate about what truth is as God sees it and what healing is, especially when the karmic cause was long ago and far away and only God can see the connection between then and now. And how about that homework, teaching your slower moving, workaday self that there is a way, a gentle way to heal civilization through God in you taking charge of this expedition. You can do this. Always victory.